What is it when we bring up the subject of death that all of a sudden everyone goes quiet? To speak about death and dying, to speak about that person in your life whom you loved and and the final time that you saw him or her, speak about that in a social situation and very quickly you'll discover this is uncomfortable. Speak about the final moments you had with that person. Uh, Speak about uh, the final things you said. Speak about the way the body looked after they were deceased. Can you feel the chill? Death is, in a Western culture, something that we don't want to speak about because we don't feel comfortable with it. We like to whisk our dead away behind a sanitary curtain in a hospital. We like to give them to the mortician to manicure the body. We don't want to deal with death. We don't know how to deal with death. So we don't want to think about it. But when we think about this clearly, we realize very viscerally that every single person in this room is going to die. You are going to die. At that moment, every dollar that you've ever earned will instantly become worthless. It will all go completely gone. Your bank account will deplete in that very instant, in the blink of an eye. Every accomplishment you ever achieved will disappear. All the letters after your name, all the degrees, all the business acumen, all all of the influence, all of the power and prestige and everything else, popularity, that all goes away in a moment of time. So too, every person you ever loved will be torn from you. Now, most people would say, what is the purpose of life? And I doubt they would say the acclaim or the money or the fame or the popularity What is it that makes life worth living? It's love. I've talked to some people and they said, I'm not afraid to die. You're not? It's only because you haven't thought about it. If life is meaningful because of love and at death, every love relationship that you have will be ripped from you, what does that say about the meaning to your life? every single person in this room. Either you'll live long enough where you see your loved ones die, or they will live long enough to see you die. But in the future, all of us will be torn away from our loved ones. So too, every memory you ever made will be forgotten. All the inside jokes, all of the the history, all of the memories... With these people, they will be vanished. It will be like men in black with that little gizmo where they zap your brain and all of a sudden, it is gone. What was it? I just saw that movie, the new Spider-Man movie, spoiler alert. What was it that was so existentially horrific about that film? That someone could cast a spell over the entire world and have you collectively erased in their minds. Not only when you look into their eyes, you have just a vacuous, empty stare, but so too, if you were to look into theirs, you wouldn't know them either. Death is coming for all of us. And whether we like it or not, whether we want to think about it or not, whether we want to minimize it or not, death is facing all of us. This this is essential to the human condition. I'm not afraid of it. I don't think about it. All of this is true unless unless what Jesus said is true. Jesus crashed a funeral of a dear friend named Lazarus and he spoke to Lazarus' sister. John, the 11th chapter, verse 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this? This is the essential claim of the Christian faith. The resurrection is mentioned some 300 times in the New Testament. It's connected with every other major doctrine of the Christian faith. This is at the center of Christianity, and Jesus is claiming to have broken death, to have the keys of death and hell itself in his hand. 
The one who died came back to life. This is the essential Christian claim. And the question is, do you believe this? Now, for years I thought, believe, 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 believe. Yes, yes, yes. Believe, as Mark Twain said, you believe something that you believe ain't so. That's, that's belief. Or uh, believe is something like Peter Pan. Uh, it's wishing upon a star. It's you hope that it's true. I, I hope that we're going to have good weather tomorrow. Something to that effect. But the Bible teaches that biblical faith is not blind faith. And what we would like to do here today is to demonstrate that the central claim of the Christian faith is supported by strong evidence. And I'd like to give you five independent lines of evidence, facts of history, and I've only chosen the facts of history upon which critics and Christians agree. Let me put that a different way. Scholars of the classics and of New Testament and history, they agree on these five essential facts. Number one, there are incredibly early sources for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it just be wonderful if we had a source that spoke about the death, burial, resurrection, and appearances of Jesus to Peter, to Paul, to his half-brother James, to crowds, to skeptics, to believers, to persecutors. Wouldn't that be nice if we had a source from history that, that spoke to all of those things? Now, I know we have the four biographies of Jesus, and those are good evidence. Those are good evidence. Think of Alexander the Great. How many biographies were written about him? One and a half. One and a half. Arian in 130 wrote about him in Plutarch in the first century. I, that, that's, that's 400 years after Alexander the Great died in 323. Jesus of Nazareth, a penniless preacher, has four biographies about him, all written within the first century. That is good evidence. But maybe you're sitting here saying to yourself, I want something better. Can you give me something better? We do have something better. We have something that is written about the death, burial, and resurrection and appearances of Jesus all within months or at most a couple of years after Jesus rose from the dead, purportedly. It comes to us in 1 Corinthians 15, and I know what you're thinking. Here we go, circular reasoning. You're using the Bible to prove the Bible. No. 1 Corinthians 15 is an undisputed letter of Paul, the apostle, Saul of Tarsus. This means that whether you're a critic or a Christian, everybody agrees that Paul of Tarsus wrote 1 Corinthians 15. And in this letter, he says this at the very beginning, what I received, I passed on to you. This is the language of Pharisees, the, you know, those really religious uh, men, uh, 6,000 men in Israel, when they had a a rabbi, like a Hillel, a Rabbi Shammai, and they heard his teaching. They would pass that right along to the people whom they discipled. Well, Paul is a Pharisee, and he's using the language of Pharisees. He's saying, what I received, I passed on to you. So, 1 Corinthians is written in AD 55. He's saying, what I'm about to write, I received this means that this antedates Paul. This is before Paul wrote this letter. This is previous to Paul. He received this before A.D. 55. So too, we see that this has a certain stanza. It's structured. That Christ died for our sins. That He was buried. That He was raised on the third day. That He appeared to Peter and to James and to the twelve. You see the structure there? Do you see that? That, 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 the parallelism? Like the Declaration of Independence? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments were instituted among men to secure the right of the governed. And I went to public school too, so how about that? <laughs> parallelism, that, that, that. It's a declaration of independence, a declaration of faith. So too, we see that Paul doesn't use the language in this little creedal formula, this, this little section that's written here. This predates Paul. How far back does this go? 
Two to three years. And you say, oh yeah, First Fundamentalist Church of Christ believes that? No. Atheistic and agnostic scholars believe that this dates within two or three years of Jesus' death. That puts us at about AD 35. Friends, this is historical gold. To have a source not written like Alexander the Great 400 years after your death, but to have it written within months or at most years. The idea that Jesus' resurrection was a legend, have you seen that on the History Channel every 15 minutes? Yeah. You know the History Channel where the truth is history? It's a joke from South Park. Anyways, <laughs> the idea that this was a legend is preposterous. This is as early as we could possibly get. Number two, the execution of Jesus. Scholars of all stripes believe that Jesus was dead before his feet touched the ground. We read again, 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins and he was buried. How do we know this? Well, we got the Gospels. We got 1 Corinthians 15. In addition, we have ancient, hostile sources, Jewish, Roman, and Greek, that all speak about the death of Jesus of Nazareth. I'll just pick one. Cornelius Tacitus, writing in about AD 110 to 115, he writes this in book 15 of his Annals. He says, Christus, which is the Latin rendering of Christ, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, the Christians, he suffered the extreme penalty. Now, what do you think that would be to a Roman? Cicero said, we could talk about beatings and floggings, but to speak of crucifixion, that is so horrific that you don't even speak about it in public company. Indeed, the word excruciate comes from the Latin excruciatus. Ex is the prefix in Latin meaning from or out of. Cruciatus, the cross. To excruciate is to literally be from the cross. Christus from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, during the reign of whom? Emperor Tiberius, who reigned AD 37, and Pontius Pilatus, one of our governors, who reigned AD 36. We got the right time, the right people, the right execution, the right person. And this is written from Rome in AD 110. So too, modern medical analysis has pointed out in the no less than the Journal of the American Medical Association in uh, 1986, where they brought together doctors and theologians and looked at the accounts of uh, Jesus' death. And one of the things that they found, among others, was that in John 19.34, one of the soldiers took a spear and punctured Jesus right between the ribs. And if you remember from that account, outflowed blood and water. And if you read the church fathers, uh, God bless them, over the decades and the centuries, they asked, what does the blood mean? What is the water symbolic of? What do these mean? And, and, and lately commentators have just said that they mean blood and water. <laughs> they mean that when you stuck them, blood and water popped out and, and this journal article said that what happened was that Jesus was likely punctured in the lung filled with water and the pericardium, para meaning around, perimeter, cardia, the heart, that sack of fluid around the heart was punctured. Hence, the blood and water flowed from Jesus' side. Consequently, they conclude accordingly interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus didn't die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. This is undisputed. We see from John Dominic Crossan, who was one of the most radical critics of the New Testament, he says this, quote, that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. When you have someone who is so extreme in their scholarly views that they're out there in the parking lot, and he's saying this is as sure as it can get. You know you've landed on historical ground. So too, Gerd Ludemann, atheistic German New Testament scholar, he says, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. 
The idea that Jesus went into the tomb, didn't die, but only swooned. He went unconscious. And then in the cool of the tomb, he woke back up. And then he got out of the tomb and he moved the two-ton uh, stone out of the way. And then he fought the guards. And then he limped all the way to Galilee. And he appeared to his disciples, lacerated, mangled, bloodied. And he said, behold, I'm your king. They wouldn't have called him the Messiah. They would have called him a doctor to help him. <laughs> they wouldn't have believed that he's the Lord risen from the dead. This whole idea, this has been uh, firmly refuted. This, this, that idea that Jesus swooned and came back to life, that's been dead in scholarship for over a century. It goes back to Strauss in the late 19th century. Number three, the empty tomb of Jesus. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and then he was raised. Paul's a Jewish author. What does it mean to a Jewish author that you were buried and then you were raised? It means resurrection. The word for resurrection, uh, anastasis. Ana meaning again, and stasis meaning to stand. Buried, entombed, and raised. The tomb was empty on the third day. What is the evidence for the empty tomb? First is there were women witnesses. Why is it in all four Gospels, women are the first ones at the tomb? Do you have any idea how scandalous this would be to a first century reader or author or person? You say, what are you, a sexist? No, they were. Okay, In that culture, they treated women like trash. Women were subhuman. And yet Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all place women at the empty tomb. Why would they do that? Here we read from Celsus, who is a second century skeptic. From that statue, you can see he has not aged well. <laughs> he had a botched nose job. Anyways, he, he said after death, Jesus rose again and showed the marks of his punishment and how his hands and feet had been pierced. But who saw this? You're claiming, you're claiming that there was a resurrection. Oh, his hands and his feet were... Who, who are the witnesses here? A hysterical female, as you say, and perhaps some other one of those who were deluded by the same sorcery. He is appalled that they're staking their claim on a girl. Hysteria. That root word, hysterectomy, the removal of the uterus. The idea in ancient times was that women were hysterical because of the moon. Women were just crazy because of the moon and lunar cycle. And so he calls her a hysterical female. Now, if you're offended at that, you're in the right. You're in the right. We've progressed as a society. My only point is, don't put modern or postmodern sensibilities back on a first century text. Because at that time, this is how they treated women. And yet all four Gospels place women is the first primary witnesses of the empty tomb. Josephus, the first century historian, said, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex, nor let slaves be admitted given the testimony to give testimony on account of the ignobility of their soul. Do you see what he just did there? He compared women with slaves. Women were considered slaves in the first century. They were treated like garbage. And to have their testimony admitted in court was considered completely suspect. It, it, it would be as though in 1850 in Mississippi, you bring in your primary witnesses and they're all African-American slaves. Why would you do that unless those were the true witnesses who were there? A conspirator would never write the story this way. Four conspirators would never write the story this way. Only historians would write the story this way. Moreover, we have two Sanhedrists. The Sanhedrin was a 70-person Supreme Court. These were the rock stars of the day. These, these guys were uh, at the top of the echelons of the religious and uh, wealthy uh, social strata in Israel. And the Gospels say that all of these men voted to put Jesus to death. These were the premier enemies of Christianity, and yet 
the Gospels say that they had the honor of entombing Jesus, taking care of his body, and putting him away in the tomb, into a rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. Why would they do that? That would be like a concentration survivor, concentration camp survivor, saying that Adolf Eichmann paid for the funeral for their dead relatives. Why would you write this story? Why would you make the Nazis look good in this situation? Here, the enemies of Christianity are taking care of the body. Let me push it even further. If they were making up the name Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus, everyone would know. It would be like if I said, I've got great testimony a couple years ago. And you say, who is it? And I say, well, uh, Antonio Scalia of the Supreme Court and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay, you say, wait a minute, that's not their names. It's Antonine Scalia, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It, <laughs> you're just making up names now. You can't make up names. There's only a few Supreme Court justices, and you just made up a few names. We all know who they are. Your story's fabricated. It's false. It's not true. Okay, what if I got the names right? And I said, it's these two Supreme Court justices. They can back up my story about the empty tomb. They could easily falsify it. Everyone knows Joseph of Arimathea. Everyone knows Nicodemus. You could go right to their house. They're the head of society. Is this true? Did you bury him here? Did it happen that way? Number three, the Nazareth inscription. Do you know that we found a stone tablet written by none other than the emperor of the Roman Empire that said a very curious thing? You see, before the time of Jesus, if you were to rob a tomb, what would happen is you would get slapped with a fine. But after the time of Jesus... The Nazareth inscription said, if you rob a tomb, you will pay a punishment, capital punishment. Why the shift? Why is a Roman emperor writing about this dinky little place, Nazareth, uh, Israel, you know, some, some province that they took over out in the middle of nowhere? Why is he writing about the laws regarding tomb robbing? And why is he writing that right after the time of Jesus? very curious. I wonder what changed during that time. This leads to the final point. All of the explanations for what happened to Jesus presuppose an empty tomb. Like the Nazareth inscription, they say, well, that means that the disciples robbed the body and they, they emptied the tomb. That presupposes the tomb is empty on the third day. Matthew 28, they bribed the guards and they said, say that the disciples stole the body. Uh, that presupposes that they needed to answer the question itself. Like imagine if I had $20 like this, and I had it sitting right here on this uh, pulpit, lectern, weird table. I got this $20 bill right here, and I leave and I come back and the $20 is missing. And I say to somebody there, I say, uh, uh, what happened to my $20? And one person says, uh, I didn't see the $20. And another person says, I saw it and somebody stole it. The second person would be telling me what? There was $20 there and they needed to explain what happened to it. By saying that we needed to explain the empty tomb presupposes that the tomb was empty. Gaze of Hermes, a uh, very well-renowned non-Christian Historian, he says, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the women found to their consternation not a body, but an empty tomb. Michael Grant, atheistic historian and classicist, he says, the historian cannot justify or justifiably deny the empty tomb. The evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. Number four, no one was expecting Jesus to knock on the door on that third day. There was no expectation of resurrection. This just didn't exist. So from where did this concept originate? I'll tell you what, it didn't originate from the Jews. Now, you might say, well, the Jews believed in resurrection. Oh yeah, they did at the end of history. 
when everybody's raised from the dead. They believed in that. Daniel 12, Isaiah 26. Uh, you get the point. They believed it. everybody's going to raise from the dead, but they didn't believe in an individual rising from the dead before that period. And if they did believe that, let me tell you this, they didn't believe it would be King Messiah. Because King Messiah doesn't get killed. King Messiah goes to kill. He goes to kill the evil Romans, the enemies of Israel, the wicked people. King Messiah doesn't die on a cross. And then King Messiah doesn't come back through resurrection. There was no expectation in Judaism for a resurrected Messiah. Didn't exist. Paganism, so Judaism, anything else would be paganism at the time. Greco-Roman philosophies, uh, uh, polytheism, they didn't have a concept for a dying and rising deity. It just didn't exist in their worldview. They thought the spirit was pure. It went on a one-way track to the afterlife. And they didn't believe that your, your pure spirit would, would make a U-turn and go back into the filth of the body. Gross. That's just such a disgusting idea. It's no wonder that Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified. Uh, to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. What was it that got Paul kicked out of the Areopagus with the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers and the, the intelligentsia of the day? They listened to Paul talk about creation and talk about God uh, moving through history and his sovereignty. But once Paul says, and he raised Jesus from the dead, they said, get this babbler out of here. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Expectation of resurrection, nobody saw it coming. If they had some kind of a hallucination and they saw Jesus walking around, as many people do, when people lose loved ones, they see their loved one. About 7% of people in a certain demographic will see a loved one uh, post-mortem. They'll have some kind of a visionary experience. In their worldview, in their worldview, seeing a vision of Jesus wouldn't have proved that he was alive. It would have proved that he was dead. If you saw an apparition of a, a dead family member, would you say, he's back? <laughs> no, you'd say, oh, he's visiting me from the afterlife or something to that effect. But you'd never come up with the conclusion that, that he's risen physically from the dead. That's precisely what they came up with. Number five, the eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Jesus appeared to, first of all, groups of people, to the 12, to the 500, and to the apostles. Now think about that for a second. If this was hallucinatory, that would mean that 515 people all had the same exact hallucination. As one person has put it, that's more of a miracle than the resurrection itself. Like imagine if we were hanging around and uh, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I, I had a dream last night. You're like, really? I love hearing about people's dreams. Tell me about it. And they're like, hey, in the dream, like you and I, we got married. And you're like, <laughs> creepy. All right, uh, I'll go with it. And they're like, yeah, we got married. We were in Vegas and Elvis was there and we got married. And you're like, oh, that's, that's cute. And then they say, so where do you want to go on our honeymoon? Because I'm going to be dreaming again tonight. I figured you'll be in. So where do you want to go? You'd say, wait a minute, dude, okay, dreams, hallucinations, those are mental events. Those aren't out there in reality. To have 515 people all have the same external mental event, an hallucination, not to mention the fact that uh, the premier people who saw Jesus were individuals like Peter, Jesus' half-brother James, and Paul, a believer, a skeptic, and a persecutor. And all of these men didn't just have an hallucination where, oh, that was, that was nice. That was great. They all came from different backgrounds, different views. And they ended up going to their deaths for believing in Jesus. Maybe some of you have had hallucinations, had apparitions, dreams, things you can't explain. Would you be willing to go to your death for it? Paul was beheaded in Rome in AD 67. That's on firm historical grounds. So too, we see James, according to Josephus, no less, not a Christian historian, book 20, 
says that James, the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, James was clubbed and stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in about AD 62. Many of us have brothers. What would it take for you to believe that your brother was the Messiah and the Savior of all mankind? <laughs> Jesus, more than that. <laughs> Jesus so influenced James. Now, James was a skeptic. John 7, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Mark uh, 3.21, it says that Jesus was out of his mind, literally crazy. It wasn't until 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, then he appeared to James, that we see a complete 180 to the point where he's willing to die in Jerusalem for his brother, Jesus. Finally, Peter was crucified by the order of Emperor Nero in AD 67. Beheaded, stoned to death, bludgeoned to death, and then crucified. Now, some people will say, that doesn't prove that what they believed was true. What about that Buddhist monk in 1963 who famously lit himself on fire? Remember that iconic scene, a drastic scene, terrible scene, to protest the South Vietnamese government. And he lit himself on fire. That doesn't prove that what he believed was true. You're right, you're right. It doesn't prove that what he believed was true, but what it does prove is he believed it was true. Yes, it doesn't prove the veracity of his beliefs. It does prove the sincerity. Let me put that a different way. Liars make poor martyrs. Liars make poor martyrs. Now, if I died for my faith, you might say, well, there you go. He's believing something that he believes is true. Fair enough. These men said that they saw the risen Christ. They didn't hear it second, third, fourth hand, or 2,000 years later. They said, I saw him. They saw him risen. What changed? What changed in the coward Peter, the unbeliever James, the violent persecutor Paul, that they would be willing to go to their deaths? Well, we read from Garrett Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. He holds the hallucination view. Bart Ehrman, hater of Christianity and all things Christian, he says, it is indisputable that some of the followers of Jesus came to think that he had been raised from the dead and that something had to have happened to make that so. See, what we're seeing here is uh, not a hallucination, not a conspiracy, not a swoon theory. What, what could explain all of this here? What could explain all of the data? Not just some of it, but all of it. I'll give you a hint. It begins with an R. Resurrection. The resurrection has the most explanatory power and explanatory scope. It explains all of those data points the best, and it explains them all and doesn't leave any out. Well, let's finish the way that we began. You're going to die. There's a future ahead of all of us. All of us are staring death in the face. We don't know when it's going to come. Five minutes, five years, 50 years. There's going to be a certain point where you're staring up at the ceiling and you're taking your final breaths. And then it's over. Forever. And every dollar you made and every accomplishment you performed and all your loved ones and all that's going to be ripped from you forever. Unless, unless Jesus rose from the dead, unless we can believe what Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. The question is, do you believe this? See, this is the, the stunning message of Christianity, the, the, the message of forgiveness and love that Jesus taught. It's so shocking that all other world religions are saying, give more, work harder, pray harder, 
sweat, push harder, be better, be more enlightened. And then you got this one religion sticking out like a sore thumb that says, it's not you working toward me, it's that I work toward you. It's not that you should keep self-justifying all the things that you've done wrong. It's that you should accept the justification that I paid for on the cross. It isn't that you should be self-righteous and say, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Let me ask you a question. If a week in Hawaii costs several thousand dollars, how much does it cost to go to eternity in heaven? You can't pay that price. You're good enough. You paid enough with your life. You can't pay that price. The, the price tag on heaven for each and every one of us was nothing less than the death of Jesus Christ. Self-justification? Self-righteousness? No, faith. Do you believe this? Do you trust in another? I remember back in 2020, there was this story that got me very emotional it was a story of a, a young boy named Jackson, and he had this cute little blonde-haired, toe-headed sister, you know, and they were out together, and a German shepherd went to attack his little sister. And Jackson, this little six-year-old boy, stood in front of his little tiny sister courageously, and that German shepherd ripped his face to shreds. You can look up the pictures. 90 stitches. He later told his father, he said, I knew that if I didn't stand in the way of my sister, that I knew that she would die. And so I figured if anyone should die, it should be me. Well, everyone in the news, especially in 2020, you know, there's nothing good happening there. Everyone in the news was just lauding this kid. What, what, what a hero, how, how courageous. And all I could think about was Jesus. If anyone should die here, it should be me. Hebrews 12.2 says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Do you know what that joy was? You might say, well, it was the joy of Going back to heaven. No, Jesus already was in heaven. He didn't need that. He was in heaven. He, he didn't need the joy to get back. He didn't endure the cross to go back to heaven. He was in heaven. You might say, well, it was the joy of the cross itself. No. The, the cross was a means to an end. You, you don't stand in front of the German shepherd. You, you don't take the wrath of God on yourself as an end in itself. It was a means to an end. What did Jesus have that he needed to go through the cross to get that would bring him great joy. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. The joy that Jesus had was you. What kept him up on that cross was the thought of you. He wanted to be with you. He loves you. He was thinking from all eternity past, I, I want... For every breath you've taken since you've been born, he's been thinking about you. He wants you to come to him. And, and he said, you know, I, I got my arms opened up every day like, like a hen trying to gather her chicks. But you were unwilling. But anyone who comes to me, I will surely not cast out. And the Bible teaches that if we choose to receive the gift of Jesus into our lives, if we pray to God and just say, God, I do believe that. I do believe that. I want to accept the gift of the cross into my life. That is a prayer God always answers. He always answers, because that's always in his will, because he wants you. You're his joy. You're his love. He wants you to come into a relationship with him. The question here is, what is stopping you from having just a mustard seed of faith and just calling out to Jesus and saying, I, 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 don't, I don't know everything here, but but God, I, I want to. God, I want you in my life. And God, I want, I want that for me. The Bible says at that moment, you can have a relationship with Christ. If you can't remember a time that you did that, we're talking about a really deeply personal thing. Just pray it in your heart as we pray here later today. Just pray in your heart to God that you could come into a relationship with him. I guarantee you will never regret that decision.